everyone. I'm Susanna Conrad, Senior Program Manager of the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, and I welcome you to our podcast series. Today, I want to introduce you the webinar recorded on July 14, 2020, titled Navigating Through Stormy Weather, Dissecting the European and US Contribution to Security and Stability in Iraq. In this webinar, we stress the Iraqi perspective on European and US-American security engagement in Iraq. Furthermore, we assessed the AU's input to the region, especially in light of the prospective results of the current US-Iraqi strategic dialogue. In the discussion I have participated, Sajad Jiat, Visiting Fellow, Middle East and North Africa Program, European Council on Foreign Relations, Kava Hassan, Vice President, Middle East and North Africa Program, East-West Institute, Kirsten Fontenrose, Director, Scowcroft, Middle East Security Initiative, Atlantic Council, moderated by Luisa Lovelag, Baghdad Bureau Chief, Washington Post. This is part of a series called Mediterranean Mornings, jointly organized by the German Marshall Fund of the United States and our foundation. We are happy to move forward with our activities in these difficult times, relying on the participation of experts from all over the world. Well, hi everyone. My name is Louisa Lovelock and I am the Washington Post's Baghdad Bureau Chief. Welcome to today's panel discussion. We're calling this Navigating Stormy Water, Dissecting the European and US Contribution to Security and Stability in Iraq. This event is being held in partnership with the German Marshall Fund of the United States and the Konrad Adenauer Foundation's Brussels and Syria and Iraq offices. Now, I think we meet today at a particularly auspicious time for this discussion. Iraq is struggling on many fronts. It's struggling economically. It's struggling with the coronavirus and tragically with the shockwaves from the death of someone who I think many listening here today will have known and will have known probably quite well. Hisham al Hashi, those are still coursing through this community and they're highlighting, as the event of this title says, the very stormy waters in which Iraq finds itself right now. We have three speakers today. We start with Sajjad Jihad. He is an Iraqi political analyst based in Baghdad and a fellow at the European Council for Foreign Relations. We have Kawa Hassan, the vice president of the Middle East and North Africa program at East West Institute's Brussels office. And finally, we have Kirsten Fontenrose, the director of the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council and a national security practitioner who has worked in positions within the Department of Defense, of State and the White House. Questions at hand today will focus on the European, but also the US perspective when it comes to supporting Iraq going forward. Questions include, what do Iraqis really want and what do they need? How can European Union and the United States be useful allies? And that discussion, I hope, will be fruitful. So I think without further ado, I will hand over to Sajad and he will open today's discussion. Thank you, Louisa. Um, welcome to everybody who's joining us today. Uh, thank you, Louisa, for remembering Hisham as well. Uh, it's very sad news um, about his death. And I think it's, uh, it's possibly an augur of bad times to come in Baghdad and something that we're certainly concerned about um, as people interested in, in, in the country. Um, Speaking from an Iraqi perspective, I would say the population differs in its attitudes towards the US and Europe from the government. The Iraqi government and, and uh, general political class believe there is a lot of benefit to be had from the EU and your other European countries outside the EU and also from the United States, but is not concerned so much about the political cost if they view themselves as being relatively neutral. The Iraqi population, however, I think is starting to view more and more uh, international partners and, and from countries as being uh, not, not worthy of trust. Especially, I think, uh, what's gone on the last kind of eight, nine months since protests, since, you know, um, several hundred people have been killed in these protests and what is perceived as uh, foreign questions, foreign um, apathy towards the situation in Iraq. The fact that they want the government to survive, they want the political system essentially to remain as is. That is a disappointment to most of the, certainly to all the political, to the protesters, but also to, I would say, large parts of the population that hoped 
um, that foreign governments would be able to pressure Iraq's politicians to change the way they do business. And since we've had the crisis of COVID-19 and the economic kind of crisis, it feels like Iraq is even more isolated and is only worthy of attention if there is a space of bombings and terrorist activity, if there is conflict with Iran, for example. Aside from that, there isn't much appetite to try to work with Iraq. And so on the one hand, you have the political class who believes that no matter what, the U.S. and Iraq will continue to, the U.S. and, uh, and the EU will continue to put uh, more resources into Iraq, will continue working with Iraq, will continue to try to um, help Iraq deal with the issues regarding terrorism, for example, regarding the economic situation, regarding stabilization. No matter what happens, no matter who's in power, the EU and the US will continue to work on that. And between the, the population, which increasingly is becoming more apathetic towards the entire political um, you know, machinery of the state, the turnout at the last elections was very low, as, as you'll recall, 44.5%. And coming into what we expect to be elections, perhaps in the next 18 months, um, it looks like a lot of people are also apathetic about you know, the, the future of Iraq um, and certainly not expecting things to improve. And I think that doesn't bode well for the EU especially because uh, they expect to be viewed in a slightly more positive light than, than the US uh, and to, you know, to not have the same baggage in Iraq as, as the US does. But unfortunately, I think a lot of the younger people um, and who are becoming more politically aware and active possibly uh, are equally disappointed in both, uh, you know, on both sides. Now, the Iraqi government requires, you know, assistance and training on the military side of things and the security side of things. I don't think um, the training mission is complete. I, I think there is a lot of training that's been done and potentially training could go on for a number of years. I, I don't think that's the right approach, but we need to kind of have a, you know, um, a date in mind to say, look, in in two years, for example, foreign troops, uh, the coalition mission, perhaps the NATO mission will end in in Iraq. What do we need to do to prepare um, Iraqi forces to be ready for that date? I don't think we're at that point yet. And it's important to have this kind of discussion because I think there is gaps in Iraq's capability. I don't think ISIS is as strong as it was, you know, three, four, five years ago. I don't think it's as strong as it was before 2014. But I do think there are still gaps in Iraq's capability to, um, to conduct counterterrorism missions, and it lacks some some um, parts of its arsenal that the U.S. and, and the EU are able to provide. Iraq still struggles with, for example, um, you know, air power. Still struggles with logistics. It still struggles with, you know, um, intelligence and, and other elements. Um, community policing, for example. It doesn't lack the manpower. There are over a million. Uh, you know, security forces or people on the payroll of the security forces. And yet we have all these gaps and internal conflicts and overlapping security responsibility, especially in, you know, what's termed the disputed areas or disputed boundary areas. Uh, I think there, there is still value in having the U.S. and the EU contribute to that security assistance. And the second part of what the U.S. and the EU can contribute um, is obviously support for Iraq in trying to reform its way out of the economic crisis. Austerity alone won't do it. I, I, I just think the population will, will push back very, very hard and it's going to be very, very painful. And just trying to spend our way out of uh, this crisis is not, is not going to be possible either. There's not enough cash there. So I think there is going to be some reforms necessary, but I think there is potential for the US and the EU to contribute to uh, assisting with that. Um, and it will help avoid this government from falling. It will help to avoid a change in politics. If Iraq begins to struggle, if there is loss in confidence in, in this prime minister or uh, you know, the general kind of um, ability of, of this government to, to get the country through the crisis, there is a potential for more hardline governments to come in. There is a possibility for the discourse in Iraq to become more hardline, and that will be damaging to both the EU and the US. But I think there are differing priorities between the EU and the US, and I guess Kirsten Cowell will, will highlight those as well. But I, I think there is value in the EU considering that now is probably the time for it to be less dependent on U.S. policy in Iraq. It needs to be aware that at, at this time, there seems to be a lot of conflict between what the U.S. wants in Iraq and what the EU wants in Iraq. And there is a possibility that the U.S. is going to undermine, perhaps accidentally and inadvertently, undermine the EU's mission in Iraq. And to use the goodwill that a lot of Iraqis, and, and especially in the political class, that have towards uh, 
the EU and much less um, negativity towards the EU, to take advantage of that and to take a lead. Up until now, I, if we're honest, we have to say the US has been doing about 90%, possibly even more, of all kind of foreign efforts and assistance in Iraq. And everybody else, the U, UN, the EU, you know, World Bank, whoever you want to put all together, probably does only about 10%. So the US has done the vast majority um, of assistance in Iraq. And, and I think that needs to change. And there is an opportunity for the EU to, to, to assume that role of, of doing more and understanding that the US is probably going to conflict with its policy in Iraq. Of course, the, the underlying reason for that is, is Iran. The US believes it can counter Iran in Iraq. Um, President Trump is on record saying we're in Iraq to watch Iran. Now, the US obviously disagrees, the EU disagrees with that. But at the same time, its, its mission in Iraq, in Iraq is tied to the US. They're part of the coalition and completely dependent on the US being there. Without the US, the Europeans could not be involved as part of the coalition. Uh, and I would say the same will probably apply to perhaps the NATO mission and probably most of the other assistance kind of programs and, and logistical support the U.S. provides for foreign partners to be involved in Iraq. So going forward, if, if we're going to see continued security assistance and we're going to see economic support perhaps, especially for, for reforms, we expect the Europeans to not be completely dependent on the U.S. And I don't, I don't know if we're there yet. Perhaps the Europeans need to have a really frank discussion with the U.S. about their policy towards Iraq. In terms of expectations for Iraq, I think while the question of you know, Iran is unresolved, the policy towards Iran, Iraqis are probably pessimistic about um, the role of, of foreign countries in Iraq. Uh, they don't expect that you know, Iraq is going to be a battleground for, for, the, for the future to come, that the US and even the EU are willing to um, engage Iran in Iraq and elsewhere at the cost of, of, of those countries. Um, and, I, and I don't think we can change those attitudes right away. It will take some time. So in the very short term, I think what, what can be done is to continue to assist you, Iraq with security, but not be drawn into kind of these proxy battles and these um, tit-for-tat cycles of escalation with Iran and pro-Iran forces, if possible. And second is to show Iraq that, and, and the Iraqi population, there is a lot of value from foreign presence by trying to get Iraq through this very difficult phase of the economic crisis at least into next year when hopefully things are not as bad, perhaps oil prices have recovered slightly, perhaps the effects of COVID-19 are not as bad. And then Iraqis will feel generally that uh, foreign presence, if it's not true presence, it's going to be you know, foreign assistance programs. Those are highly valued, especially European ones. At this moment in time, there's a lot of disappointment about what foreign governments have done, done for, for Iraq in general. Um, and I'll end it here, and I really look forward to what Kawa and, and Kirsten has to, to say. And I think at this moment in time, as you said, it's, it's a very interesting period, and we've had a strategic dialogue with the U.S. I think we expect the strategic dialogue, perhaps with the Europeans, to, to begin as well. And I would say that Iraq needs to have a strategic dialogue with Iran as well at the same time. Without these kind of frank exchanges and, and you know, setting what the expectations are for each side, what are the requirements to maintain good relations, I just think we're going to kind of be tiptoeing around the difficult issues without resolving. Thank you for that. I think um, it's particularly helpful as you as you have to tease out the difference between the population and the government as having different attitudes here. And also, I think it's you know it's important to point out this idea that the two the two parties at the table, the European Union and the United States, could potentially undermine each other. Um, Moving on to Takawa, you're going to talk to us today about the Europe, European perspective on all this. Um, what, would you, what would your take be? Thank you very much, uh, Louisa. Thank you very much also for, uh, for the organizers, GMF and, and CAS. Um, uh, happy to speak at this uh, webinar. And also thank you very much, Louisa, for remembering Hisham al Hashim, as uh, Sajad said, um, a, a true Iraqi nationalist you know who wanted a different political order where human rights were respected and where uh, you know Iraqi um, you know he was activating for a, a decent functioning democracy in Iraq so thanks for remembering him um, so uh, I only have five minutes less uh, you know the time of Sajad so uh, I try to be very brief so excuse me if I will be too brief I would be happy doing the Q&A, you know, to elaborate on some of the issues which I will raise and also, you know, to answer the questions from the, uh, you know, fr from the audience. So um, 
I'll, I'll speak, you know, uh, briefly about, about how EU can, can help Iraq to become a, um, a center point for regional dialogue and cooperation, a far cry from what is going on nowadays in Iraq, you know, being a, uh, a theater for proxy wars and conflicts. And what I present is um, um, mainly based on an ongoing project we uh, implement with our uh, partner, CARPO, a uh, think tank in, uh, in Bonn, and which is funded by EAS. And this project is called Iraq and its Neighbors. And its aim is exactly to, um, uh, um, to you know, uh, help Iraq to have some difficult conversations with its neighbors, Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Jordan. Uh, and, you know, through these conversations, develop joint ideas to improve bilateral relations, but also hopefully, you know, that these ideas would contribute to uh, regional cooperation. Uh, at some point, and that Iraq is no longer um, a theater for proxy wars. So uh, to begin with, um, Iraq's real problem is not ISIS, nor is it the Iran-US regional rivalry and proxy conflict. I think Iraq's key challenge is more ingrained, is more internal, namely the politically sanctioned corruption and state capture of post-2003 political elite that has literally whittled away at the state from within and now has it poised to crumble. It is the responsibility of Iraqi leaders to implement true structural reform or risk turning Iraq from a fragile state into a failed state with disastrous consequences for the region and beyond, of course, for Iraq and EU as well. So within this you know, complex context, I think EU definitely can help Iraq, as Sajjad said, you know, in the process of implementing some long due reforms, but also to improve relations with the, these five neighbors I mentioned. One of the key takeaways of our project, Iraq and its Neighbors, which we implement with CARPO, is that particularly at a time of US disengagement from the region and America's maximum pressure on Iran, now, and here again, I agree with Sajjad, now is really the perfect momentum for the EU to step in, develop and implement a regional policy with Iraq at its core, at its center, that will support cooperation between regional rivals and hence hopefully contribute to stability and security in Iraq. And, and why EU is well positioned, uh, a legitimate question, I would say um, EU has multiple advantages. And, uh, you know, through our engagement over the last year with Iraqi officials and experts and also experts from uh, and officials from the neighboring countries, you know, time and again, they have, uh, you know, mentioned to us that EU has multiple advantages. What is needed is, you know, to develop a strong assertive policy, you know, towards Iraq and the region. And the first advantage is that from the point view of Iraqis, Iraqi experts and officials, um, they trust EU. You know, uh, uh, it's important that EU has this trust, you know, uh, in Iraq. Um, so uh, this, is, this is a precious commodity that needs to be, you know, uh, utilized to the, to the utmost. And um, second, um, it has balanced relations. EU has balanced relations with ver various regional players. Third, EU possesses the capacity for reflection and self-criticism. And also, EU has a very rich, diverse, you know, diverse history and political transformations, which hopefully may provide some useful lessons for Iraq and the region as a whole. Yet, EU, Iraq strategy faces also considerable challenges. First, uh, the complicated and ever-evolving Iraqi and regional political dynamics. It makes it just difficult for each international player to, you know, have a, um, um, you know, um, a, a consistent uh, uh, policy. Second, Iraq's structural, political, economic, security, and cultural complexities. Third, Iraqi decision makers lack strategic vision and political priorities and policies with regards to neighbors and to regional cooperation weak and politicized state institutions that deal with transparency and accountability, oscillation of, of the political and security situation between stability and instability, the complex nature of decision-making process within the EU itself, and the difficulty of the you know, development and implementation of an assertive foreign policy in general and, in, you know, and, and uh, towards Iraq in particular. And finally, as Sajjad said, the impact of US policy on EU's decision towards Iraq. Having said that, I think, uh, you know, to be, uh, to, just to mention a few practical ideas from our project, the EU can support Iraq, its relation with its neighbors, regional cooperation, you know, by giving support to, um, to you know, I, these following ideas. Uh, 
First of all, the issue of climate change and environmental cooperation. You know, this is, this is an important issue for Iraq, but also for the entire region. And in, so in this regard, it could support environmental cooperation between Iraq, Iran, and Turkey on the impacts of climate change through joint research and, and data development related to water management, biodiversity, preservation of indigenous species in the marshes in southern Iraq. Also, EU can submit uh, scientific data to Turkey and Iran that keeping water will impact the entire region and in the, in the long run will be detrimental for their own national interest, you know, because of the dam policies and also because of the impact of climate change in both countries. They keep waters and this, is, this has a really very uh, negative impact on Iraq's food security in Iraq's also, you know, uh, water security. And Iraq, Iraqi Kuwaiti relations have improved considerably, but still there is an urgent need uh, for further trust building in political, economic and cultural relations to address mutual misperceptions, particularly because of the invasion, you know, in 1990. So one particular area where I think EU could support and encourage uh, Iraq Kuwait relations with also a positive impact for the entire region is the establishment of a joint Iraqi Kuwaiti think tank that could produce regular ideas, intellectual groundwork and research in benefit of bilateral relations, but also addressing the mutual misperception towards each other. I'll conclude that in light of the socioeconomic and potentially political impacts of COVID-19, the EU can help Iraq and its neighbors also in the development of joint ideas and projects that aim at supporting national and regional resilience of health systems. You know, the health system in, in Iraq is really almost close to collapse. So, but also some other countries in the region and uh, in the new normal, the global new normal and regional new normal, health and regional resilience and national resilience should be at the center of any, you know, uh, EU policy towards Iraq and the region. To conclude, I go back to the start, only Iraqi leaders can save Iraq by implementing real, no token, long overdue reforms. EU can, you know, can help Iraqis and Iraqi leaders to establish a functioning, decent democracy, the ideal of Hisham and Hashmi and others, you know, who, uh, you know, who were killed during the, uh, you know, the, 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 the protests since October. You can help Iraq to establish a decent functioning democracy that is at peace with itself and the wider neighborhood. And why you can do this, I'll go back to what I mentioned that, you know, the Iraqi experts, Iraqi officials, they trust EU. So here EU has a precious, you know, um, um, really uh, advantage that should act on and, and develop a, um, you know, um, a, a policy which, is, which supports improved bilateral relations between Iraq and its neighbors, which also supports, you know, the, uh, the difficult process of reform uh, in Iraq. Thank you. Thank you, Kaur. I think that was a um, remarkable amount of information in five minutes. So I think there's a lot to ask about in the Q&A, but I think first we go to Kristen, sorry, Kirsten, uh, for the US perspective. Sorry. Hi there. How are you? Good to see you, Louisa. Um, let's talk a little bit about the strategic dialogue, because I know that's kind of what everybody's wondering, you know, whither the dialogue and where will it lead? The first success of the U.S.-Iraq strategic dialogue, frankly, just in the fact that it happened at all. And this was not just a success for the U.S., but also for Iraq and, frankly, for Iran. It indicated that Iraq is making headway. We honestly did not think they would make so fast in forming a government. It's a great sign. Um, and the breathing room that was promised to Prime Minister El Academy by both Tehran and Washington was granted leading up to the dialogue. And that was also a success in itself. So that success appears to have been fleeting as evidenced by the Kitab Hezbollah statement this week saying that it will ramp up activities to attempt to force the U.S. out of Iraq. During the dialogue, there was no intent by the U.S. or by the officials in the Iraqi government to discuss the status of forces um, during the dialogue itself. If that had been the intent, we would have sent a delegation led by the Department of Defense instead of the Department of State, as we did. And I would argue that it's in the best interest of the U.S., um, to push off a discussion of the status of forces until after presidential election in November. Why? Because the El Hashid brigades in Tehran will make operational choices based on the decision made about the presence of U.S. troops in Iraq, and we can expect an increased tempo of attacks on U.S. troops if the decision is made that they will stay. This will put the U.S. in the difficult position of having to respond to defend themselves against these attacks, and that could anger the Iraqi street and impede progress on the other strategic issues at play in the dialogue. There's a big debate in the U.S. government about that right now. 
We saw rocket attacks on U.S. forces in the week following the strategic dialogue, and they're continuing until now, even without that formal decision that the U.S. will remain. So why rush a discussion that may only embolden them before the bigger picture is discussed? Um, at the dialogue itself, the meeting was about two hours long. It was virtual because of COVID restrictions. They discussed, as you all saw, security, economics, politics, culture. Um, economics and energy were the topics that were discussed in the most detail. The U.S. had been pushing to reduce Iraq's dependence on imported Iranian energy for some time already. And in my opinion, the time for the U.S. Um, to push that is right right now. And the government is, is pursuing that chain because, one, Iran does not have the gas to spare in the amounts Iraq needs. December's protests over fuel prices taught them that they need to meet domestic needs before they think about exporting. The new finance minister, Ali Alalawe, supports the idea of joint ventures, which were opposed by the former minister of energy on nationalistic grounds. And now there may be opportunity under Minister Alawi's experienced guidance for the U.S. and other international companies to bring in the expertise and capital that Iraq will need to capture its gas, the, the gas that's currently flaring, and to put it on its own electrical grid. So on the economy, though, the work was probably going to be tougher. And to both Sajid and Kala's points, it's going to be internal. The Iraqi government has to tackle issues like pension reform that will not make them popular at home. Any government that tried to do this would not be popular at home. So this is tough. Right now, they're borrowing funds even just to cover their salaries, much less do things like infrastructure bill or economic stabilization. And no donor wants to give money to cover salaries. Um, they've got issues like double dipping. I mean, you know, there are a lot of people are making money on the chaos and no one wants to give up that largesse. So they've, they've, they've got an unpopular stance that they need to stick by and if they want the international community to stay with them and to support their economic stabilization requests. The security conversation, the dialogue was pretty brief. There was very little disagreement between the US and the Iraqi officials. Um, the US is not seeking a permanent base in Iraq and there's currently no plan to renegotiate the status of forces agreement. But the pushback obviously came from you know, Iran-backed surrogates. They want a very short timeline. They were even talking about 60 days for withdrawal of all coalition troops, which does not work for the U.S., nor likely for the rest of the coalition. And of course, the U.S. was not going to speak for the coalition during that dialogue. And these proxies want to acknowledge the, the January 5th council representative vote that insisted that the prime minister revoke the U.S. invitation to be in country. Of course, it did not work back in January because we had a caretaker prime minister in Iraq, but... Um, but now this situation is different and they'd like to force that, force that decision. The agreed upon communique that came out of the US-Iraq strategic dialogue did not really acknowledge these points because there was not broader support for them among the Iraqi delegation. So that's why you won't have seen discussion in what was public. And um, you know, the next step that's hoped for is a visit to DC by the prime minister. But um, you know, and, and the government, the US government, the State Department stay really optimistic about what can come out of these conversations. People that I've spoken to on the ground inside Iraq and a lot of Iraqi analysts seem less, uh, less optimistic. We'll, we'll wait and see what happens. If I were Prime Minister al Kadimi, I would be asking for assurances that my visit to the U.S. would not be publicly messaged by the U.S. administration as a win or as a sign of my choosing a side. You know, the usual diplomatic rhetoric has life or death consequences for him back home. I might even try to push my visit back until after U.S. elections. Unfortunately, politics moves so quickly in Iraq these days, he might not have the luxury of time for that. Uh, right now, though, the, the positivity of the U.S. strategic dialogue that you're seeing here is endangered by a re-escalating security situation. The al Hashi brigades continue their low-scale but relentless rocket attacks on the bases that the U.S. and the coalition share with Iraqis. And during the last week of June, as we're all tracking, the U.S. turned to Prime Minister al Khatami and asked him to, to fulfill two of Iraq's governmental roles, one of which is exert control over the al Hashid brigades who are under the MOD umbrella, and the second of which is protect the forces, the foreign forces that are present in Iraq by official invitation, in this case, the U.S. forces. Um, remember that Article 51 of the U.N. Charter, it is debated, uh, allows a hosted force to protect itself if the host government is unwilling or unable to protect them. So if a Qatami had chosen not to act, the U.S. might have, which could have led to additional escalation. Fortunately, al Qatami did act, sending Iraqi security forces to raid a Qatab Hezbollah base and arrest 14 pretty unimportant, frankly, um, Qatab Hezbollah members. But unfortunately, this operation was um, a, a failure. You know, Qatab Hezbollah took over the green zone. They forced the prime minister to free its fighters. al Qatami had to call Nouri al-Maliki to request the militia stand down. Um, and then there were additional clashes with tribes just yesterday that don't bode well for him. Still, this operation taught 
us in the US and I believe in the international community quite a bit about what's happening on the ground in Iraq, as did the assassination of Hisham al-Hashimi, regardless of who was responsible for that act. The ability of Qatab Hezbollah or other militias to twist the arm of the government in Iraq, even when good intentions are in place, and the ability of groups to shoot close advisors to the prime minister as a tool to manipulate the government, they point to the fact that the Iraqi government would be crushed under the will of fringe groups wanting to control the country if the US or the coalition were to leave. They simply aren't ready to secure themselves, much less the country. When the US withdraw in 2001, a vacuum was created that ISIS exploited and we can't have this happen again. The US believes it should not be the one possible point of failure to prevent this from happening again. And that a greater international effort to assist Iraq with protecting itself against another such extremist blossoming is, you know, is necessary. It'll strengthen Iraq's hand, Iran's hand in Iraq if Iran is again the only country that is willing to help Iraq push IS and its offspring back. And a stronger Iranian hand in Iraq will mean a stronger hand they'll have in Lebanon and Syria, placing the Quds Force and Hezbollah more robustly on NATO's border. But, but honestly, that's the best case scenario for NATO. If Iran does not come to Iraq's aid against ISIS and the U.S. Is, is departing, whether by choice or by Iraqi parliamentary insistence, then the Eastern Med will again have ISIS on its beaches. So securing Iraq really is more an urgent security imperative for Europe than it is even for the U.S. right now. And you know, keeping threats away from NATO's borders is one shared goal of the U.S. and Europe vis-a-vis -vis Iraq. And I think there are a few others, like another includes preventing IS from creating a base of operations or claiming territory they can use to create a caliphate narrative again and use it for recruitment. Another includes creating new markets in a large country with an aspirational population for US and European businesses. Another would include ensuring the stability of a key global energy source. And another would include supporting a struggling democracy in a region that is short on them. I think there's a lot of room for the EU, UK, US to work together. Um, and to, to points that Sajid and Kawa already made, the EU really benefits from a rosy reputation on the ground in Iraq than the often despised US. So working together could mean something like putting a fresh European chassis on the security assistance governments there and backing it with the US engine or something like that. I'll turn it back over to you, Louisa, for a discussion. Description of the depth of the challenges being, <laughs> being faced. Um, I mean, one thing you, you described very, um, sort of history, Kirsten, is, is the threat from militia groups. Obviously, you know, as everyone has said today, a lot of the challenges that Iraq faces are internal challenges. They're potentially things which, which can't be helped by, by outsiders. They'd need an Iraqi solution. But I wonder, um, you know, Sajid, first of all, is there any meaningful role that you see perhaps the US or the EU having in trying to take on these groups, trying to shape the message, trying to provide security support? What do you see going forward? I think it's a tricky position for, for the Iraqi government, frankly. Um, they want to avoid the impression that they are acting on the behest of, of the United States. They don't want to be caught up in this conflict where they're taking on, you know, uh, armed groups who are clearly powerful, uh, but be seen to do so at, at the kind of uh, orders of the United States or, or other countries, because that just saps away all the legitimacy for the government. And it frankly will breed much more opposition. Um, I think it's important for Iraq to uh, impose the rule of law for the right reasons. Yes, uh, the United States is in Iraq at the invitation of the Iraqi government. Yes, foreign troops should be protected, diplomatic missions and other assets. But at the same time, Iraq cannot pursue action against these groups just because the U.S. wants Iraq to do so. Iraq needs to do it for its own reasons. And number one is imposing the rule of law. At this moment in time, I think we're caught, the Iraqi government is caught um, in part of this proxy conflict. The Americans are raising the pressure on the Iranians. The Iranians are finding ways to hit back against the Americans. And Iraq is a good venue for this. And the Iraqi government is caught between trying to impose the rule of law, trying to stop these groups from carrying out these uh, attacks, and at the same time, pleading with the U.S. not to increase hostilities with Iraq, because they understand it will be played out in Iraq. Now, we have had a very troubled history with some of these armed groups uh, going back, you know, immediately after uh, the invasion in, in 2003. Almost in 2004, we, we had, you know, two battles with the Mehdi army, for example, uh, inside Iraq. And then we had problems with, with, with Bedou, 
and all these special groups that were formed, even Asab and al Haq. And prior, former Prime Minister Maliki had to go to Basra. He actually flew with his own, he drove there with his own bodyguards all the way to Basra to take on the Mahdi army and, and, and other elements in Basra because they were uh, you know, uh, extracting all the resources and essentially acting as a kind of shadow government. Um, and he barely made it out with his life, but it was a, a moment of reckoning. It changed the discourse. It showed that the government was willing to go further. I think whatever government comes in, if it's not Kazemi's government, if it's another government, they, something similar has to occur. There is a red line that has been crossed frequently. Too many of these groups are assuming that the government is too weak. But we can't have this being conditional on uh, you know, assistance being provided to Iraq. So the US to dictate to the Iraqi government to say, we need you to go and raid this site or attack these, this group or arrest these members before we'll consider even more kind of support and so on. I think we have to operate on an Iraqi time set. I think Iraq needs to consider this as a, as a real problem, possibly similar to the issue with ISIS, as difficult perhaps, uh, that, that this is a, a, a counter-terrorist operation or a campaign that needs to take place. We cannot depend purely on uh, you know, foreign support for this. This is these are Iraqi groups. These are Iraqi fighters or, or, or Iraqi, uh, you know, uh, members of, of militias. These, this is an Iraqi issue. It needs to be dealt with by Iraqis. And part of the issue is to maintain legitimacy for the government. If the government becomes just a, a you know, a, a, a proxy for the U.S. in its conflict against Iran, then the government will not be able to to impose rule of law. It will become a, a side in all of this. The point is that the Iraqi government has to rise above this and show that it has the capacity right now, as, as Kirsten pointed out, after the raid um, on the Qatar Hezbollah uh, site, uh, it, it, we could clearly see that the Iraqi government struggled with the reaction. Qatar Hezbollah was able to get dozens of vehicles into the green zone, surround the CTS offices, and make very plain and clear demands over what it, what it wanted from the government. And essentially, the government had to agree. And Kalman was embarrassed by the optics of it all. And I think that we know that can't happen again. So at this moment in time, the government does not have the ability to take on these groups, but it does not want to be pushed by the U.S. to act according to a U.S. timetable. That then makes the government even more weaker. So it, it is a difficult situation. I don't, I don't envy the prime minister, but I, I think we're approaching the time when he's going to make some, take some of these difficult decisions on. I just hope that the government is prepared for the backlash. Remember, targeting Qatar Hezbollah, you're not just targeting that group, you're sending a message to all the other armed groups out there. And so, you know, even if it's just Qatar Hezbollah that's being targeted, you will get a reaction from Asab al Haq, from Bedr, from Qatar Sayyid Shuhada, from 50 other groups. You will get a reaction from Iran as well. And I, and I think at this moment in time, the Iraqi government is just not ready for that. You've outlined a pretty comprehensive set of, of suggestions for what European nations could do in Iraq. Um, but I wonder what, what appetite you see from Brussels to actually take greater responsibility? You know, who will step up to the plate? Very good question. Uh, uh, great question. Very complicated. And also particularly, you know, given the fact that EU, just like, you know, uh, US, um, other regional powers, international powers are preoccupied with, you know, dealing with COVID-19 and uh, consumed with that, but also, you know, Brexit. It looks like, you know, I mean, you know, also it's an important, you know, uh, issue for a uh, problem for, for EU to deal with. And also, you know, the, the economic impacts, the long-term economic impact of COVID-19, you know, in Europe itself, it's, it's massive. So um, uh, the, when I said, you know, now it's time for EU to have a more Iraq assertive policy at the same time, this is also a very challenging time for EU in Brussels to deal with all these issues. Is there an appetite at the moment? Um, it's difficult to say at the moment there is an appetite for such a, you know, um, assertive strategy. But given the risks in Iraq, and other countries in the region, Syria and Lebanon, you know, we are talking about a region almost close to complete collapse. Almost, you know, close to complete collapse. You know, we are talking about three countries uh, dealing with, you know, uh, you know, Syria. We know the situation in Syria, Lebanon, almost, you know, uh, it's almost bankrupt. Iraq is heading to that direction. So when you have this complete collapse in Levant and in Iraq, I mean, the, the first international power to feel the impact is EU. So it's for the, also for the sake and interest of EU to, you know, no matter how, um, you know, um, how, um, you know, difficult it is to develop such an assertive Iraq policy, also given the internal 
difficulties of coming, you know, arriving at such a policy. I think it's, it's in the best interest of you itself also right now to step in and play that role. I'm um, just actually following up on that. There's a question from the audience on that. Um, I mean, do you see any, any factors that might hinder cooperation in the European Union at this stage? Yeah. So, um, you know, as, as there are different, you've got 27 countries within EU. So um, arriving at a common foreign policy, it's, it's, it's an appeal battle, right? So you've got the big countries, France, Germany, and some other countries. They are, you know, um, they all have also their own individual foreign policy towards Iraq. Um, so what we see is actually, you know, Germany is quite active in Iraq, you know, on different levels, supporting, you know, uh, civil society, supporting security sector reform, you know, also supporting other, you know, sectors. Also other countries are, are, are active, you know, within the coalition against ISIS, but also, you know, giving support to different projects in, in different parts of Iraq. Um, so the, um, I think what I, I think is important at this stage, if the, you know, like, you know, the, the, if France and Germany would take the lead to develop, you know, try to develop and bring other countries on board to develop, a, you know, a strong Iraq policy that would uh, go a long way into, you know, also trying to convince, you know, the, um, the other countries to uh, to be part of that, you know, um, that assertive policy towards Iraq. And Kirsten, just for my curiosity, um, you, you, you spoke about the fact that the strategic dialogue was meant to be, um, was not meant to be held under the conditions it was. It was, I think, initially slated to be a bit longer in the event it was a sort of two hour Zoom call. Um, do you feel that that sort of changed the, the process at all? Did it mean that things that were maybe slated to be on the table didn't get discussed? Or was this always just going to be a sort of first preliminary um, meeting? Both. It definitely, you know, it went from two days to two hours. So they certainly had to sort of sideline some of the conversations. And in, in some ways that was convenient. You know, when you don't want to discuss the status of forces, it's nice that you don't have to, you aren't forced to by uh, tyranny of time. Um, but it was envisioned, you know, strategic dialogues in the U.S. context are, are a process. And so this was envisioned as the first of many. It was envisioned as kind of the launching. It was envisioned as the conversation where the priorities would be set. Here are the things we would like to pursue together, um, but not where decisions would be made. Decisions aren't really made during strategic dialogues anyway. It's both, both parties lay out their priorities. Both parties lay out what they want to, to work on together. And then both parties also lay out things that might benefit one over the other. And there's this dance about negotiating, you know, kind of negotiating them. Um, and that, that wasn't able to happen in this one, in this one either. Uh, there, there weren't a lot of red lines laid out, but there were some things clarified, like we're not looking for a base. Um, we're not getting out in 60 days. We're not asking you to get out in 60 days. We want to do more cultural exchanges. We're expecting movement on your energy sector. Um, we want to move on our energy sector. You know, there were some things that were important to solidify but there's a lot of work that has to be done afterward. And whether that will happen through additional strategic dialogues or whether it will happen through these quieter meetings, like when Katami comes to DC, if that happens, we'll, we'll see, especially, you know, they've got four months um, to move on this. I think we should expect to see some movement just because it would be a foreign policy win for this current US administration if they can say they were able to arrive at some kinds of agreements that improve the US-Iraqi relationship. I mean, you mentioned the, the DC meeting that's, that's coming up. Um, one problem that Kamiyov obviously has is the fact that he is seen by many people as being quite close to the US. Um, and you raised the idea of this being covered by the Trump administration, not as a foreign policy win, or at least not, um, not sort of publicly um, to sort of um, beat the drum on that front. How, I mean, how do you see that messaging? Uh, what kind of what would that messaging have to look like, given the the kind of challenges that he faces anyway, even even going there? He does face challenges. I mean, this is really the kind of thing that can get him killed back home. Um, so, I, and I think he needs to make that very very clear to the U.S. If I make this visit, you've got to agree that we we do this fairly quietly. We put out very sort of protocol esque, and you don't use this as a way to poke Iran in the nose because it will mean that my government will fail and then you won't have a friend in Baghdad. So I, I think he can make that argument and it's gonna to have to be pushed that way because it's, it's going to be too tempting to this administration to say, we won, we won. Um, uh, and, and, then, and then, you know, that is very, 
quite short-sighted. Um, but he's got to come to DC if he wants to have certain conversations. Gina Haspel's not going to go to Baghdad, you know, and there, there are some things he needs to discuss in terms of intelligence sharing, continued CT operations and the like that can only really happen here behind closed doors, will not happen over unsecure Zoom calls, for instance. I mean, Sajjad, I think obviously the, at least the sort of most high profile issue on the table at the strategic dialogue is the, is the troop pullout um, or any sort of whatever shape that might take. You mentioned in your sort of opening remarks that there is, that, you sh that people should be looking at a, a timeline, they should be looking at what conversations they need to have, what they need to provide. And I think one thing that has been mooted in the past is the, the idea that perhaps the, the coalition contingent could draw down on US forces and maybe have a larger base of European forces, of NATO forces. Do you see that as a kind of a going idea? Do you think that's a, that's a possibility or is that just something that is an old idea that's sort of not, not functioning anymore? No, I still think that's an idea with some merit. And again, that's window dressing, but that's probably okay. You know, a lot of the people who are in Iraq now doing the training would stay in Iraq now doing the training. They would just be put on European contracts instead of on American contracts, you know, but, but they're not representatives of the U.S. government, so that shouldn't upset people. And if it, if it takes window dressing to make the Iraqi population comfortable with the fact that these trainers are there, that's fine. I mean, you know, let's, let's do whatever we can to be able to continue the important training that Sajid mentioned being so crucial, but, um, but, but also not risk inciting a negative public opinion that might derail the goals we're all after. I mean, Sajid, do you, do, you see, do you see it that way? Do you see a sort of a, a kind of an emerging um, change in the force or is it just gonna shrink bit by bit in line with how it currently is? Well, so there's been some preliminary discussions um, on this topic, the idea that perhaps there could be a rebadging exercise, you know, um, as Kirsten mentioned, to have, you know, NATO take on a greater role, to have European missions um, take over essentially the, the coalition. From my talks with, you know, um, diplomats and military officials in, in Baghdad, the critical point is if the US is going to be as committed to Iraq or not, if the US is going to continue to put as much effort, then rebadging is certainly possible. We can, um, make it appear that the Europeans are leading the foreign troop presence in, in, in Iraq if the US is going to continue supporting the way they do at the moment. However, if the US is pulling back, Europeans essentially, from what I understood, were completely dependent on US presence in, in Iraq. So it, without the Americans being there, it's not even possible for the Euro Europeans to remain. And so I think there, there needs to be a, a, the discussion between the two sides, really, the Europeans and the Americans, over what is going to be the, their kind of presence in Iraq uh, in the medium term. If the Americans are pulling back slightly, but continue to you know, uh, put all the effort and resources, frankly, that they expend in Iraq, uh, then the Europeans, I think, would be much more comfortable taking a leading role, um, considering rebadging under the UN mission, under NATO, for example, under a specific EU Iraq program, um, a training program, a security assistance program. These are all possibilities. But the Europeans would need the U.S. to remain, you know, at close to what it is providing at this moment in time. If the U.S. shrinks that dramatically from what it's doing at the moment, the Europeans won't be able to do any of that. Now, this is what I understood from, from speaking to people there. In terms of, you know, on the political front or on, on the domestic front, um, you know, I, I don't think Iraqi population, as I say, is enthusiastic about having foreign troops in, in Iraq for an extended period of time. And I guess that applies to populations, you know, everywhere else in the world. Uh, but they do realize that Iraq needs security assistance. The issue really is more political. It really involves, you know, uh, Iran and others. If this was purely about assistance for Iraq security forces, for training, for countering ISIS, I don't think we'd have as much of pushback against, you know, foreign troop presence in Iraq. Really, the issue has been about, you know, what are foreign troops doing with regards to, to, to Iran, for example encountering these other groups. So if we can change that discourse, if we can extract a way where we separate these two issues, where foreign troops, foreign missions are assisting, you know, Iraq purely on the counterterrorism kind of mission, and we take away these other elements that is dragging Iraq into a proxy conflict, I don't think we'll have a, 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 as much of a problem. Um, we also have to be clear that NATO is not as equipped as the coalition is in terms of training, especially for counterterrorism. NATO is, it is based on, you know, land forces, traditional armies. Uh, and, and not specialist counterterrorism missions, which is what the coalition has been able to provide. So if there is a rebadging, if there is a change in missions, Iraq will lose 
out in some aspects. And I don't think it's possible to entirely cover up the absence or the reduction of U.S. support to Iraq just purely by moving names around. I think if the U.S. pulls back, there is going to be a loss in capacity. That is absolutely without question. I mean, if the U.S. pulls back, massive loss in capacity, massive loss of training, massive loss of capability on the ground. To such as point, you know, NATO doesn't have air power and some communications and things like that that the U.S. provides to a lot of operations. And, and NATO has already said that if the U.S. withdraws, NATO withdraws. They're not staying without a U.S. presence. So when it comes to the CT fight, for instance, um, you know, you need, the U.S. has got to stay or Iraq is on its own. Um, perhaps with Iranian help if they were willing to help again. But uh, you're, you're not, the training mission, what's, what's interesting is that the original mission was purely training and purely CT forces, two sides of the US, of the US mission in Iraq. That's it. They only started responding to militias um, sponsored by Iran when they were attacked by them uh, because of the opposition to their presence in the country writ large. But really that is what's in in the U.S. mission, and that is what's in the NATO mission, is the training and equipping. So, so the missions themselves um, are probably very positive in terms of what Iraq needs and most of what the Iraqi population would want to see. But what you're, ha what you're seeing right now is because these proxies are targeting U.S. forces who are, and coalition forces who are there doing this training and doing these CT operations, they're being forced to defend themselves and respond. And there are civilian casualties and there are Iraqi casualties involved in that. And Iraq becomes that battleground. If the militias could be convinced to lay low um, and allow the training to occur, then they wouldn't wind up being targeted and you wouldn't have Iraqis caught in the crossfire. I'm just looking at some of the questions coming in. Uh, one thing we haven't discussed today, which has been hugely important in recent months, has been the protest movement, which began in, in October of last year. Um, we're not seeing those sort of same mass protests, um, or at least not necessarily that same demographic uh, protesting, I think, at the moment in the same way. But it's certainly something in, in private when you talk to when you talk to European diplomats, American diplomats, that I think they were, you know, they were sort of quietly positive about, right? They saw it as a positive thing that people were calling for their rights and they were doing it largely peacefully. Uh, Kawa, I'm interested to know, do you see any role for the European Union in supporting any form of sort of civil society aligned to that? Um, yeah, is there anything they can do on that front? Because it's not going away. Thanks, uh, Louisa. So you're right. I mean, right now, because of COVID-19, the, you know, protest movement is, you know, the streets are more or less empty in terms of, you know, having protests. But this is not the end of the protest movement. You know, the October uprising, that's, I would like to, you know, conceptualize it. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's there and uh, it will be there for the foreseeable uh, future, you know, so long as the structural problems which led to its emergence are not addressed and tackled. And those are, as I you know, mentioned, the, the failure of the post-2003 political order to establish a decent functioning democracy. That's it, basically. And um, what EU can do in this regard, EU has been supporting, you know, human rights, EU has been supporting civil society. What is needed right now, in my view, is uh, to have, um, you know, given the fact that we have a, a somehow a transitional government, it could be there for a year and a half or two years, what is doable in terms of support to the protest movement? In my view, what is doable is first and foremost that accountability. Those who are responsible for, you know, killing more than 700 people, and you know, you've got over 25,000 injuries, those people should be brought to justice. And that is also what the government has promised to do. So um, in this regard, I think that's, that should be the, the top priority um, and, and you know, calling on the government to, to make good on that promise, uh, no matter how the backlash would be from, you know, uh, from militias. This is crucial that, you know, there is accountability you know, finally that those who are responsible, uh, you know, uh, for, for killing of these young protests said that they should be brought to justice. Here, I think, you know, EU and, you know, other countries uh, should do more on, you know, continuously uh, uh, calling on the government to, to make good on that promise, but also providing protection for those who are in danger. You know, there are a lot of, you know, uh, activists in danger, and, uh, and I know, you know, EU is, is doing a lot on the ground. I know that, but, um, but uh, EU and in, in cooperation, you know, in collaboration with, with UN and other, you know, US and, you know, uh, other countries, they need to time and again call on government to make good on that promise, bring those 
you know, uh, those, you know, those who gave orders and those who executed. And, you know, I know government is working on that. There's a committee which is working on that. And they say, you know, probably in a few months, they will come up with a report. That will be, you know, a really um, um, a historic moment. For the first time in the history of modern Iraq that, you know, a state will be held accountable or those who are, or the parallel state, those who are part of state and the parallel state will be held accountable for crimes committed against Iraqi citizens. Apparently, I still can't use the mute button. Um, any other thoughts on how, you know, any role that the US or the, or any constructive role that the US or the European Union could play? Or do you think at this stage, they just need to sort of back away and see this as it largely or entirely has been as a sort of uniquely internal Iraqi phenomenon? I really want to hear Sajid's comments on this, actually, but I'll just pipe in and say that I think it's imperative that the US and Europe um, get involved in this. And, you know, there, there are so many programs um, for civil society on the ground occurring right now. We just don't hear about them all the time, but the, but the U.S. I can speak for certainly invests quite a bit in engaging with um, with on the ground organizations. And I think you know, whereas we can't force the government to make changes based on what civil society recommends, we can certainly amplify the voices of civil society, give them um, tools for making sure they're able to get their points across in a way that feeds into legislative process, for instance, that kind of thing. Um, so there 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 are ways to to help funnel and direct and consolidate what civil society is trying to achieve without meddling in Iraqi affairs, as it were. Yeah, I, I agree with Kirsten exactly that. That's the balance that we have to strike. If we're going to have more foreign assistance for civil society in Iraq, we have to make sure that it is not perceived as interference and it doesn't endanger the people receiving that assistance because they believe to be collaborators or supporters of foreign governments and so on. And I think it's, it was very tricky during the uh, protests um, in the first phase, October, November, when there was a lot of um, even outpouring of, of demand for foreign support for protests from the protesters themselves. Um, but at the same time, there was a head scratching moment saying, well, if we do get assistance, what assistance is it going to be? How's it going to look like? How are we going to receive it? And how do we protect ourselves? And I think that question is still there. So there is a need certainly for support for strengthening Iraqi civil society and for activism and for amplifying voices, as Kirsten said. A lot of you know, um, civil society in Iraq is dressed up as independent, but actually it's tied to political players and powers and so on. And it's not really independent in that sense. And at the same time, there's not a lot of protection offered, as we saw from the protests, you know, the number of people killed was horrific, as well as you know, over 20,000 were injured. Just speaking out is, uh, you know, as the tragic tale of Hashem and Hashemi, for example, is sometimes signing your death warrant. And so, you know, we have to be aware of the need to support at the same time that support can have a cost directly to, to the people receiving it. And I, I, I'm not sure we've figured that out from an Iraqi perspective or from the international perspective yet, what the, the, the right balance is and how to achieve it properly. Yes, there is a need. Yes, there's a demand actually. Um, and yes, there's capability certainly to provide, but how do we do it that, you know, ticks all these boxes without endangering anyone? I, I don't have the exact kind of answer myself, and I've yet to hear a convincing kind of case where we can say, right, this is the best way to do it. I think part of it may be trial by error, but you know that's dangerous as well. But part of it, I think we need to have a kind of real strategy around how to strengthen Iraqi civil society, strengthen Iraqi media as well, uh, to make it you know, uh, more transparent, more accountable, um, and then to, to say, right, what initiatives are going to serve Iraq over the long term, not just over the short term? How do we, do we best prepare the next generation of Iraq's leaders, the next generation of the politically active Iraqis? Not just right now in terms of getting their voices out there, but what can we do to help the next generation of Iraqis over the next five to 10 years? I think that's quite you know, um, more beneficial than just focusing on the immediate short term, but I don't think there's a lot of appetite to think, to, to think about Iraq in that way. How can we help Iraq in the next 10 years? I think a lot of assistance and uh, a lot of thinking done by foreign governments is around, right, how do we help Iraq in the next six months or a year or a year and a half? And nobody really has the appetite to engage with Iraq over a longer period. My suggestion would be to try to think of it in, that, in those terms, because I don't think our problems are going to go in anytime soon. And civil society will need assistance because it has to be built up properly. And that will take many, many years, not just over short-term programs. I think um, as we're coming up to time, that brings us nicely to the fact that it is, as you guys say, an incredibly delicate balance for, for all sides to be treading right now, but one which seems to, at least on the discussion today, need a, you know, a long-term and sustained effort to, to make this a long-term long project. Um, I mean, just ending remarks, starting with you, Sajid, what would you, you know, how would you like to end today? What would your sort of main takeaways be 
I, I think if for, for from an Iraqi perspective, uh, we we expect um, Europeans and, and Americans to be more competent than our own politicians. We expect them to have everything figured out. We expect that they, you know, have solutions and they can press magic buttons and suddenly, make, you know, make our situation better. At the same time, you know, we're quite critical of our own leaders and government and so on. But we haven't yet figured out um, what is the best way to improve governance inside the country. We can't continue to just blame our politicians when we vote them in, and we can't continue to expect assistance from foreign governments when, at the same time, we're pointing fingers at them. And I think that's the troubling bit is. We would like to be engaged with America and Europe and other countries, including Iran and everybody else. We want to be on good terms. We want to receive all the benefits of having those friendships. But we don't really have an idea of how to protect not just our sovereignty, but our ability to govern ourselves better. We're kind of stuck um, at this moment in time. I think this needs a bit more thinking going forward. And that will help the US especially to understand what Iraqis want from it. Because I've talked to quite a few of our friends and, and we had a discussion with Kirsten a few months ago. Sometimes the Americans are saying, well, what does Iraq want from us? It's not clear. You know, the Iraqis, they want a lot, but they're not willing to you know, do stuff to receive that assistance. And we don't understand the nature of the Iraqi-US relationship because Iraqis are not clear. And I think that's you know, part of the debate that we need to have in, you know, inside Iraq as Iraqis and, and the next generation of leaders is to think, well, you know, what is it that we want from the US and Iraq? We can't just have our hands held out for assistance. There's much more to you know, having these bilateral ties. And, and I don't think that's, that's clear for us yet. Howard? Yes. Right. So um, I think the the idea of engaging, you know, the uh, the next generation of of potential Iraqi leaders is definitely, uh, you know, um, an important issue to uh, to pay attention to. It's a long term, almost generational endeavor, and uh, easier said than done. Particularly when you address that to a machinery like EU. So we need to find the right you know, um, the right approach to convince EU to do that. I think it's in the interest of EU to engage, you know, the, um, you know, the new leadership and also the new leadership or the future, you know, leaders, but also, you know, to build some, first to have an Iraqi-Iraqi dialogue between these potential leaders. I think that's important, Iraqi-Iraqi dialogue. EU can play a role here. And then we can expand that to an Iraq regional dialogue between new generation of leaders. Um, EU can play a role in this. Um, yeah, and, um, and, uh, and, and above all, you know, um, what is important is, you know, an understanding and also um, at the EU level that Iraq is too important for, you know, for, for EU's regional policy in the region. You know, that there is also this, the idea of this EU-Iraq strategic dialogue. I think uh, we should also think about that and, and how to design an, uh, you know, um, um, an Iraq EU dialogue, Iraq Iran dialogue. So in that regard, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I uh, definitely support, you know, the idea of, of Sajat. And uh, um, the civil society, going back to the civil society, you're right, Sajat, you know, and it's, you know, it's always, um, it, it's always a, um, a conundrum for international actors, how to find the right balance about supporting civil society in a particular country without endangering them, and more so in the case of Iraq. So um, we need also to look into some, some lessons from some other, you know, somehow relevant similar cases where international support was, you know, done a good job by striking the right balance. Yes, that's it. And Mira would, um, was said about the need for an Iraq-Iraq strategic dialogue and, as Sajid referenced our conversation several months ago, about the need for the Iraqi government to create a wish list. Here's what we want from all of the international players so that all of us stop um, getting involved with unsynchronized strategies and, you know, potentially screwing them up. Here's, what we, here's where we envision the EU playing a role. Here's where we envision Iran playing a role. Here's where we envision the U.S. playing a role. And anyone else who gets involved in these sectors gets involved underneath that lead. And, and make it very clear, and, it, and then have a conversation about that. It doesn't mean that every country is necessarily going to agree to it, but then we know where the government of Iraq stands, and we understand exactly what they're requesting from each, um, each party, and hopefully the Iraqi people will be behind that, so that when each government engages in that, you don't run into problems. The EU doesn't get accused of meddling if they're involved with civil society, and the U.S. doesn't get accused of 
meddling if they're involved in CT operations, you know, and Iran doesn't get accused of meddling if they're working on energy infrastructure build or something, you know, so that, so that there are kind of accepted roles that the population buys and each external country buys. I would say that would be really, really helpful. And then Louisa, just because you're on here, I'm going to make a pitch for, for some, for the media, because I, I think one thing the U S and Europe can help with that we haven't so far is, help making Iraqis aware that the painful fiscal reforms um, that they're going through are not unique to them. And they're not a lark of their unseasoned government. You know, these are things that Jordan is experiencing, Bahrain is experiencing. These kinds of reforms are happening everywhere, both because of COVID, oil prices, whole nine yards. But if you're Iraqis and you think, well, I've been drawing a double salary for all these years and now these upstarts are coming and tell me I can't, you think it's unique to you and you think if you push this government out, then, then you're done with that problem. But if they're aware of what's going on in terms of fiscal reform conversations and how difficult they are for the populations of their neighboring countries, they might be um, less inclined to try to shove this government out and realize, you know, these are things we actually need to pursue. Um, it, there could also be help in exposing kind of the abuses to the current system, because I think if, the, if there's a greater public awareness of how the current fiscal systems are being abused, um, then they, they might buy into the kinds of reforms that the government is going to try to implement. And you won't have the government um, held hostage by those who are benefiting from them. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I think this has been a good discussion today. And thank you to everyone who sent in questions as well. Um, I can see there are a few we haven't answered, but I hope we've kind of got the broad, um, the broad brushstrokes. Um, all that's left to do really is to say thank you to the German Marshall Fund for the United States and CAS in Brussels and Serena Rock. Um, and thank you guys. It's been great. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks. Bye. We invite you to listen and visit us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn or SoundCloud for more information. You can find all the links in the description. Please remember that we will publish more episodes during the next weeks. Thanks for your attention.